so you're talking about the sharing and context of children. Then how does the first sharing within children are influenced or compared to the importance of food transfer from their family, from adults? You mean the food that adults share with children? Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Let me let me send it back to you and make sure that I'm understanding. So you want to know if their relationships among so children are similar to the relationships they so have with adults? So what is the resource of food that children can get per day? How much they share with each other within children and right. how much they get from their adults and whether the amount from adults go into their sharing patterns with each other? Fantastic question. I'm currently analyzing the data right now. So what that means is I had to use kids as my focal. Yeah. And then I had to monitor every bit of food that was given to that child by anyone in camp. And then I'm still in the process of going through that. We don't have any data like that for any population. Um, I think it's just because now I'm realizing why it's so time consuming in order to track the resources. Um, there's a lot of variation. In fact, there's so much individual variation. What it looks like right now, and I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but what it looks like right now um, is that the more sharers, right, the more the more people you have, um, the more provisioners, I should say, the more provisioners that a child has um, means they forage less, and by default, they're sharing less. So with child? With the child. So the more that adults are giving them, the less they're sharing amongst themselves, because they're bringing home less food, because they don't have the pressure to do so. Yes? Um, so you, your research is about the um, ontogeny of pro-social food sharing, right? And you said there was a correlation between the age of the children and how much food they share. So like, um, in your first-hand experience, is it just that the younger children are less likely to share, they're just less pro-social, or...? Um, younger children. So, again, back to this whole thing of age, right? So, under four, they're just less likely to have a lot to share. So, that's why I've broken it up. That exact question, and thank you for asking me, is what prompted me to break it up into package size when I started doing more detailed analysis. Because amongst two and three year olds, it may be that they may be only sharing five or six berries, which really isn't a lot in terms of provisioning. Um, but if it's their favorite berry and it's a highly valued food source, then maybe they are in fact being pro social because they're sharing, they only have eight berries and they give you four. Uh, that's why, that's part of the reason why I'm not so sure that energy is the best way for me to track this stuff. Because you might, you, I think some might look at this data and say that. That maybe they're not being very pro-social at four because they're not sharing as much. But if they have less to share or we're using the wrong kind of measurement. So we just, we just don't know enough and I'm still pulling it apart. But I think part of it is just how much they can physically collect in order to bring back and redistribute. And that's what is motivating their choices. But at five, something's happening at five. We see all of these spikes um, right when middle childhood is starting. So I, I still want to do much more with this. Do you, do you I just like oh, yeah, a quick follow up. So, okay. um, so ba just based on your research, do you think it's more likely that younger children uh, and older children are sharing the same portion of their food, or do you think that it would actually be something that's probably changing? I think older children are sharing more of their food, based on anecdotally based on what I have right now. So I wanted to go back to the kinship. Okay. Oh, go back to it. Sure. 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 Here? No. I guess it's just you gave us the result, but we didn't see it. So that would be the next one after that graph. Oh, after that, okay. Where it was, 41? Yeah, that's right. This one. Yeah, so, um, and, and I was, um, Rick kind of asked this question, and I thought I made her stop talking, so uh, I want to go back to this point. But, um, so there should be some way to correct. Well, first of all, okay, one question is, is, is this all kin? I mean, and, and what is the degree of relatedness that is included in the kin category? Ah, oh, excellent question. So I only I only code it up to first cousin, because after that it's hard for them to mm -hmm. differentiate. Mm -hmm. So it, was, okay. it makes anything that we do much less meaningful. Right. Um, so the two questions, one is, I guess one of the things is how do you how did you test this and what what exactly um, how things were measured out? So um, so you didn't look at actually degree of relatedness. I coded for degree of relatedness. 
And does that have an impact? Yes. So a higher degree of genetic relatedness correlates with more food sharing. Oh, okay, there it is. Yeah. So the more closely, the more closely related. Um, okay. So basically, this was just collapsed. I didn't tease it apart, right. and I was so blown away by that. But I then went through, went back into all of our demographic data and our interview data, and then I recoded it. Okay. So, so what does more more food shared in amount for energy? Food? Yes. So it's not only just bigger package size in terms of overall more food. They yeah. just overall throughout the study period they gave more of it, but they also gave it more frequently. So I, I did both more because and more frequently. more and more frequently. Okay. Yeah, more and more often. Yes, and um, and so do you have a way of have you thought about looking at um, uh, availability? So are they sharing? I mean, there are a lot of related kids in these camps. Yeah, I mean, so uh, you know. I always think about this, so if these were my data, these would be baboons or chimpanzees, and, um, and I'd, be, I'd be interested in, in whether or not this is a function of the distribution of these kinds of diets in the population, or a selective preference where you can demonstrate that, there, that there's a difference between what you'd expect based on their distribution and what you actually see. And this is why I'm now starting to think I want to do modeling, because I'm not so sure, I'm not sure how, because they're all together in a big, in a big group, and well, there's no way for me to pull it apart. I would need, I would need a different, I would need different conditions. I think I would need conditions that don't exist, no, unless I'm think, thinking no, about it. Differently. I don't think so. I think what I mean, I, I don't know what the, your QAP model does. I don't know that statistics. I'm not quite sure what exactly that is done there. But I mean, basically, what I mean, in, in a simplistic way, the graph is that you have. I just did this. Thing graduates this morning. Um, so if, for example, the, you know, 50% of the food sharing was among close related individuals and they represent 50% of the diets in the population, then right. that's not very surprising. Right. But if there are 5% of the diets and there's 50% of the sharing, right. then you have this big okay. disjunct. Okay, so this was another gift that these children gave me. Um, 50, I think it was 54 and 52, and I'm not remembering which one it is, but yeah. 54 were kin, I think, and 52 were right. non-kin. So they managed to sort themselves out nicely that way for me. Yeah. Of the sharing, um, there, there was not, no more sharing was done, only looking. There was, there was, how do I articulate this? So looking at just the kin dyads compared to the non, who these, using the kid as an actor, the kid mm -hmm. who was giving his food, um, they gave more food, more food was shared among kin just looking at those actors as, as the givers. Per, per diet? So that's the other way to do it, is do it per diet. So that's oh, I yes, I also did it, yes, I also did it per diet. Yeah, I broke out, I broke out each diet, and it shakes out the same way. <coughs> right. So if there's another way I can beat it up, I'll do it. <laughs> Give me the tool and I'll put it in my toolkit, because I, I want to make sure that that is what's going on here. Do you have data to tell us that all the children were in camp with each other? Yes. All of the time, or the same amount of yeah, time? Yeah, the same amount of time. Okay. I have, I, I correlated it with all of my scan sampling. So and they, that's what your UAP thing uses? Oh, so, so many hands. Okay, yes. What, what do you know about the way in which the children learn uh, how to behave, how, how to collect the food, when to shift? Do you identify more? I think you mentioned something. I can identify it in, uh, what I think are norms based on long-term, you know, ethnographic work that, you know, based on a lot of the stuff that, that Nick has done that we've then built on. Um, and in terms of sharing norms, again, this maps really nicely onto what's happening among the adults, um, which I was a bit, I was a bit surprised to find. It was fantastic, but I was a bit surprised that we would be seeing it at five. Not only in terms of the distribution of foraging labor and what kids, because there really is no reason why a five-year-old girl or five-year-old boy shouldn't be targeting berries and why he starts targeting small mammals instead, right? Other than this is, they're, they're tracking themselves and it's starting at a very young age. Um, we see the same thing with food sharing. These, uh, I, was, I was talking this morning to the grad students and they, it was fantastic because they brought up an excellent point and something that um, I often forget to mention, it's important to mention, that these adults are choosing to reside with one another. The unrelated adults in any given Hadza camp are making the choice to reside with one another. The kids don't have a choice, they're with their parents. 
Um, so some one of the grad students this morning asked me, um, well, so what do you think these kids, so these kids, the unrelated kids that are sharing, they're making the choice to share with this person and maybe this relationship will be, maybe it's influenced by their parents' relationships. And I think by default it is, in fact, linked to the relationship that the parents have, given that their parents are already choosing to co-reside. So this is where it gets really murky, and this is where it gets hard to pull it apart. So what, how are they developing these sharing norms? I can ask them in interviews, and I can look at our long-term data. In interviews, again, the answer you get from kids over and over and over again is, we are Hadza. This is what we do. So it's really hard to figure out what kind of instruction. Um, so when I ask the parents, I get much more interesting answers. Um, and when I ask the parents, they say, well, they know what to do because they live with us. And I said, well, do you actively teach them? Do you tell them who they're supposed to share with? They said, no. We don't tell them. They have to sort it out themselves. And that's why we don't bother them when they're doing their thing in the middle of the day. Do you see much punishment because they are not behaving in a proper way? Um, I see much more punishment <coughs> older kids to younger kids um, in terms of not being, quote, unquote, fair. But adults, well, yeah, adults threaten to punish far more often than they actually punish. Um, and that's usually for doing naughty things in camp. Um, if I could follow up on a Roberto's question, yeah. it seems to me like given those answers you get from your interview question, that the only way you can be able to address this question would be by videotaping the sharing interactions themselves and um, looking at, um, especially like the autogeny of responding to, so do, if, they, if they ask, you know, could I have some of that? Or, or, to what, or do they spontaneously offer food? And because one could imagine that the ontogeny of those two things is different. Absolutely. The children would learn first to, you know, when they're being asked for food to give it, and only later would they learn to spontaneously. When they're not asked. When they're not. Right. And so I, I can, this is a really, I have to be very careful how I answer this question, um, because there seems to be an epistemological difference in terms of the way some, some of us c collect food sharing data. Um, with the kids, it's tricky. It's tricky because I would have to figure out a way to hide the video camera. Um, because every time I tried to film everything, it completely disrupted anything that was going on. And nine times out of ten, I had a face in the <laughs> like this, and they were... I mean, so part of it is, it's really hard for them. So, so I've thought about this. I've thought about how can I mask a video camera so that they don't know it's there. Yeah, that's not easy to do. It's harder than you think. These Hadza kids are so incredibly aware of what is going on in their world and in this little microcosm. I cannot hide a video camera. So the other thing I thought is, well, I can hide one on myself. That's what I'm going to do. So that's actually my new plan. My new plan is to get like a spy cam. I'm, I'm absolutely serious. And somehow put it on my person. Because that's the only way that I can capture this stuff without affecting their behavior. Um, adults are different. Half of the Hadza anthropologists you talk to say that the video camera doesn't change anything that they do. The other half say it's incredibly obtrusive and it changes everything they do. So we have six in one half dozen in the other. So I'm thankfully I haven't had to do this with adults, so I don't have to I don't have to come down on one side or the other. I have. I have I have coded I've, I've coded it and I haven't analyzed it yet. I have coded it. Um, but right now the only begging begging, the only hands out I see are from the little ones. So it's unidirectional. So I would need long to, uh, yeah. but it's, it's at, yeah, but it's, Thank you. yeah, no, great question. Thank you. So I think that the, the, one of the first graphs that you showed, it was like age, um, is this sharing or collecting? No, collecting. Collecting. This is where you said age was not, did not significantly predict the amount of sharing. The amount of that one, that number 23. 23. Oh, oops. Sorry. Yeah. So it looks like age does have a significant effect up until about age 10, which like, looks pretty clear there. And then it sort of starts to go, it looks right. like a normal distribution, basically. But yeah. um, so what I'm wondering is sort of two things. One, okay. um, are there trade offs in terms of the other responsibilities that those kids are starting to have around, the, around camp starting at age 10? And then also I'm wondering how this kind of maps on to some of the, the skill versus strength stuff. Uh, and, uh, great question. Rebecca, 
great question. Um, so again, right, it's all about foods targeted. So that was my initial prediction, is I thought, oh, okay, well this makes sense to me because maybe they just have much more to do in camp. Um, but the boys kind of mess it up. So girls have much have responsibilities starting at around 10. They're, they're supposed to be sharing more. I mean, they're encouraged to care for the younger kids in camp. They're in charge of water collection. They're in charge of cleaning the house. They're in charge of tending, building and tending all the fires. Um, they're in charge of um, putting out any war that may erupt between kids in camp. The boys are not. So the problem is that they're, although some, we can say that, and that that may in fact be a cultural norm. Some girls aren't doing that. So it's really hard to make any prediction based on responsibilities because it depends on where, this is where it gets really messy. It depends on where you fall in the lineup. It depends on if you have older siblings or younger siblings. And so what you do in your particular household in terms of how much responsibility you have messes it up. So you can control the workload of the lineup. You can, exactly. I don't have a big enough sample. So I would need to collect more data, which I'm trying to do in order to increase my power. So I'm, par, par, that question, I just need more time. I just need more time to get a bigger sample. But and then yeah, the skill versus strengths? Yes, so again, interesting. Yeah, it just it maps directly onto, onto resource choice. So we do, especially when we're getting into honey and any type of medium game. I mean, even though they're small boats, you still actually, they still, you still I, I don't I actually measure it. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head what kind of, how many pound pull we have on the little bows, but I've measured all of them. And so, yeah, I mean, you see similar stuff to Rebecca and Doug's stuff. It looks incredibly similar. Yes? So there's a, a just a brainstorming here, but okay. a possibility why you get this, this dip after 10 is with the girls, it, as you said, they have childcare responsibilities. But another possibility with the boys, that is you get the same pattern in each sex for totally different reasons. The boys, now the 11 year olds this doesn't apply to, but the 12 and 13 year olds it certainly does, um, their growth rates may be substantially higher than the girls at that point. That's so right. their caloric demands are much higher, so they may be increasing their yield but returning with less to camp because they're eating it outside of camp because right. they themselves actually need a lot right. more. Right. So Which they're sharing less by virtue of bringing back a much smaller fraction of their right. yield, even as their yield quantity. Which I'm still, that I'm still trying to figure out, where do I have that? I'm still trying to figure out a way that I can actually test that, but I had the same, I had the same idea. So my, I was maybe saying that they're feeding their own excess requirements, but I still have to figure out a way to pull that apart. And I, I've come up with some ideas that I'm hoping to be able to test in terms of actually doing energy looking at energy budgets and actually measuring it. Um, well, if you know how much food they're getting from adults in camp, um, and you know how much they're sharing, and you can estimate their <coughs> their energetic needs just on yeah. the basis of standard tables. Right, right? which is what then, I'm, yeah, then, I'm doing now. I mean, the, the, the difference between what they're receiving from adults and um, what they need is what they're eating in the field. I hope so. <laughs> It's got to come from somewhere, so that tells, that tells you what their total yield is. Yeah. Um, you can extrapolate what their yeah. yield is, and then you can figure out how much of their yield they're sharing. And I've started doing that based not on age, which is how most of those standard tables are devised, but based on weight, which is much more, sure. yeah. But yeah, I'm starting to, to pull that apart. Can I just follow through? Yes, yeah. Okay. So another possibility for the boys that I was talking was that if you're making a switch in research, resource choice at that age, so you may have sort of peaked at your efficiency for right. bringing back the answer right. or something, and then you start to the boys start learning right. to hunt bigger game, and they're sit there failure right. rate is higher. And this is also where, and this is something we didn't have time to talk about, but this is also where parents get incredibly lively in interviews and have a lot to say um, about when boys should start hunting and what foods they should start hunting. And so there is pressure back. This is back to your to your norms and how do they learn how to share this is different, but how do they learn how to forage? And this is where they're encouraged to go out. They're encouraged to go and walk about. They're encouraged to try for bigger animals. They're encouraged to do target practice in camp. Um, so, so figs are little kids food or something like that. But everybody loves them, so figs are a problem because they're so delicious. Um, so you mentioned fairness, and I think someone else mentioned punishment. So what exactly constitutes fairness for, for the children and for the Hadza, and what kinds of behaviors were they being sort of? Um, 
and I have a second question too. Um, okay. Yeah, so throw it out there and I'll yeah. do So beyond age five, were there any um, children who couldn't participate in the food economy and how were they for whatever reason they had a disability or they... Okay, I'll um, answer that one first yeah. because that one's much, much easier. Yes, absolutely. Um, there are kids that have either physical or mental disabilities that preclude them from doing much foraging. And were the other children still sharing with them? Or yes. Was it just Yep. The other children were still sharing with them, and for those particular cases, again, I have a really small sample size, so I couldn't do much with this. Um, their siblings tend to be some of the biggest superstar collectors I have in the entire sample. Their older siblings tend to be provisioning them a lot. Yeah, so I can answer that one. Now let me back up to the other one. Um, it depends on who you ask. It depends on if you're talking about children and children, kids to kids, or you're talking about adults. So I can't, the adult one, we could actually, I could be here for another hour talking about what how the adults think of as fair or not fair. Um, but if I, I would have to, I'll have to give you some stuff to read um, because that one's a really tricky question to answer. But in terms of food sharing and food distribution, when the children talk about fair and unfair, it's when you don't, when you have food and you don't share it, right? Or in particular, when you have a lot of food and you don't share it. You're off the hook a bit. There's not a lot of social sanctioning that happens kid to kid if you don't have very much and you don't share it, you don't share it, you don't distribute it widely. But if you have a lot, and you're in a communal setting and you don't share, you're dinged. And they comment about it and they talk about it. And, and if they have to pick in a scenario who they would choose to share food with, there are kids they don't ever choose because they never share with them. So that that is unfair to kids. Um, and food distribution tends to be something they talk about most when they're talking about fairness. That's their go-to scenario on how to determine whether something is fair or not. So building actually on the Building on that question, I was wondering, within a particular age cohort, is it the case that those children that are more successful at gathering calories, that they share basically more? And then there's two ways of answering that in absolute terms and relative to what they've collected? It's hard to do it by age cohort because we see such wild distribution. Um, what I've tried to do is look at similar family situations, like look at birth order, and start putting further things because age cohort doesn't seem to be that a prediction no, I mean, so within a particular slice of age, of age. Mm -hmm. right? Some individual, there's going to be variation in right. the extent of collection that yes. they've succeeded at. Yes. So let's say that I'm a really successful collector. Okay. Right? Is it the case that now I share more and therefore, no. for instance, I have a more important role within the social network or not at all? Not at all. In fact, some of the biggest superstar collectors I have um, tend to be chosen to play with the least frequently and tend to be selected as someone that you don't want to share food with. Okay. It depends on where they're distributing. It, it, it all depends on where they're distributing their yield. So if they're distributing it, if they're one of those kids that pretty much only distributes to their younger siblings, then the likelihood that someone else in their age cohort, right, because if they're the same age, you're not going to be a sibling, um, that someone else in their age cohort is going to select them. It's all about distribution. So you have to literally just follow the energy and see where it goes. And there are kids that don't share at all and are incredibly popular and are listed as the most popular kids. So you wonder how those free riders snuck through. <laughs> that makes that. They, those guys break my brain, those popular free riders. Um, one of the characteristics of middle childhood juvenile period maturation is that uh, you're not sexually mature, but you're uh, capable uh, of activities that you weren't. Right. And another is that um, on average, you will perhaps have a younger sibling and maybe another sibling. That is, some of your behavior will be driven by the changes in your standing in your household, right. your king group. Right. So those would be things to look at regarding your middle childhood hypothesis. Right. What is it about it? And the, the other yeah. is that um, in terms of development of, of, of mind, you, you, you grasp the intentionality of others, not only in a dyadic way, but grasp where you sit in a social network. So and that's something that a three-year-old can't do. And absolutely. Can't do. And this is something kids do talk about in interviews, is, is, is this appreciation of social roles and at what point they're expected to take care of their younger siblings. Yeah. Um, more than just, I'm going to tie a baby to you even if you're protesting and you have to hold the baby for 10 minutes. It's very, very different responsibilities for when you start collecting enough and bringing it back to redistribute. Um, that's why I'm now playing a, a lot with birth order, because it's the one measurement I have that's a reliable measure where I can start looking at status in household. 
So again, I just I need to get more more data, more so I have a much bigger sample size. But I'm I'm hoping to I'm hoping to be able to play with some of that. Uh, my other question that has to do with um, individual differences. There are mm -hmm. huge individual differences huge. that you pointed out. And you've analyzed your data by demography, by differences, and so on for very good reasons. And you have great ethnographic data, but. Um, can you get inside the black box of all the individual differences? You, you have, there, there are other categories you could use. Uh, there's temperament, there's the health of the child, there's, yeah, uh, there's many other things that um, might be predicting the huge individual differences you see on the scatter plot. I agree with you. My reviewers do not. <laughs> um, I agree with you, but I think part of that is so highly variable, and it's so... It's, it's very difficult. One thing I can say to speak to this issue, which I think is an interesting point, and I don't really get to include it, but I think that it, I can climb inside the black box for a moment. Um, there's one particular family uh, where the mother is developmentally delayed, and the father fell into a fire as a young man. And so he, both parents, are unable to provision, they can't even provision themselves, let alone the three children that they have. All three children are fine. They're active, they are, they've hit every developmental marker, they're great, they're fantastic foragers. These, this particular family breaks all the rules. Because this particular family, the oldest daughter, who was 12 at the time when I was out there for my 14 months doing my dissertation data collection, was provisioning not only her mom, not only her dad, not only her two younger siblings, but her aunt and her grandmother. When you have situations like that, it's very difficult to predict individual motivators or what is driving, uh, why are they such fantastic producers. If she doesn't do it, no one else is going to feed, they don't have any other family in camp, no one else is going to feed the three-year-old brother if she doesn't do it. And when I asked her confidentially in interviews, she said, she, she told me that. She's, she is very aware of why she has to forage for longer, eat less, and she's also very unpopular. The adults in camp adore her, but the other kids in camp want to have nothing to do with her. It just struck me that this scatter plot opens up the possibility that there are other things that we know about the children. Yeah. We could even be predicting more of the variation yeah, than, I agree. than the category we're using. Yeah, well, on that, sure enough. <laughs> 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 <laughs>